Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Mustafa Akyol and I'm a senior fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity, focusing on the intersection of Islam, modernity and public policy. And I'm today uh, happy to be your moderator at this policy forum on Tunisia's authoritarian turn. Uh, first, let me say a few words on why this discussion is necessary and important. Tunisia, a small North African nation compared to some other bigger countries there, is one of the 22 Arab countries in the MENA region, that is the Middle East and North Africa. Uh, but throughout the past decade, many political observers have praised it as a uniquely promising uh, political experiment heading towards a rare model in the region, which is liberal democracy. Tunisia was the very country that initiated the chain of revolutions against longtime dictatorships in the region, generally known as the Arab Spring. Uh, in, in that would began in 2010 and just spilled into 2011. Uh, Tunisia was also the only country that brought this wave, the Arab Spring, to success by drafting a liberal constitution and advancing a parliamentary democracy. That's why I myself have the praise the Tunisian model in various articles in the New York Times or elsewhere, also in Cato publications where I examine freedom in the Muslim world. However, exactly a year ago, Tunis Tunisia took a different turn. Uh, President Kais Said, who, who was elected in 2019 with a popular vote, disbanded the parliament, began treasuring the media, began arresting politicians or putting travel bans on them. Uh, he dismissed judges, and which are also signs of a growingly authoritarian uh, rule. Uh, he then recently drafted a new constitution, which has one very visible uh, feature, which is creating a very powerful, extremely powerful presidency. Uh, which is also a, a sign that makes a lot of people worried about the future of Tunisia. Will it, will it join the club of authoritarian countries uh, in the Arab world? So today this, we will discuss what is happening in Tunisia, why this matters, how Western policy makers should respond. And uh, we have a great team to discuss this uh, topic. One, uh, one of our guests, speak, guest speakers is Radwan Masmoudi, uh, a Tunisian himself and the founder and president of the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy. So he's been studying Tunisia itself, but also the meaning of the Tunisian experiment for the broad issue of reconciling Islam and liberal democracy. Thanks for joining us, Radwan. Uh, thank you for welcome. having me. Pleasure to other, be with you, Mustafa. Great, thank you. Our other speaker is Monica Marx, a professor of Middle East politics at the New York University, Abu Dhabi. She's an expert on Tunisia, and also Turkey, uh, another troubled country in the region, I should say. And she's right now in Tunisia, actually. She's been following the events on the ground. So she's joining us. Thanks for joining us, Monica, too. Thanks. And finally, we have our Cato Institute, uh, my, my Cato Institute colleague, Doug, Doug Bando, who's a senior fellow at our foreign policy team, closely following events in the Middle East and other parts of the world. He recently visited Tunisia and wrote a very informative article titled Tunisian Democracy is Slipping Away. Uh, you can uh, article, read the article on our website. And thanks to you for joining us too, Doug, as well. I think you're in D.C. Great. Uh, wonderful. So before we begin, I would like to uh, share a note to all our viewers who are watching us online. You can ask us questions anytime during this event. Please feel free to type them in. And we will try to pose them even at the Q&A session, but also even before that uh, to our speakers. So let me begin with Radwan uh, Masmudi. Radwan, you and I know each other for a long time, and we both had uh, hopes for broader democratization and liberalization in the region, in the Middle East. I myself from Turkey, I got disappointed at some point. And now I think you're not happy with the current you know, trajectory of Tunisia, but it's a long battle. Uh, so tell us what happened. I mean, please, in just uh, seven, eight minutes maximum, uh, then we will have a second round. What went wrong in the past one year? Exactly what happened, especially for those who are not maybe following all the details of these events? Well, thank you very much, Mustafa. Uh, and thanks to uh, the K2 Institute for having this uh, very important and timely event uh, on, on Tunisia. Tunisia, as you mentioned, is a small country, but I think extremely important for the Arab world, because if we want democracy to succeed, uh, and along with the word democracy, of course, I include human rights, I include good governance, accountability, transparency, all of these things are included in the word democracy. If we want that to, to, to be the model for the Arab world, there is no better 
uh, case, no better country to start with uh, than Tunisia. It's the easiest one for several reasons. People who know the Arab world and know Tunisia know that uh, Tunisia is ready basically for democracy. And Tunisia has been a successful uh, democracy, uh, ranked a free democracy in, in the uh, Freedom House uh, ranking, the only one in the Arab world in the last six or seven years it has been ranked totally free, not partly free, but totally free. Uh, and, uh, and so Tunisia is very, very important in that sense, in the, in the sense that it can prove that democracy can work in the Arab world and that Islam and democracy uh, can be compatible, not only in theory, but also in practice. And this is why Tunisia, I think, is extremely important. For example, the, in the last six or seven, I mean, since, uh, since the Arab revolutions, two huge successes, I think, in Tunisia. The first one was writing the first democratic uh, constitution uh, in 2012, 2013, um, which passed in the Constituent Assembly with 93%, 93% of the elected constituent uh, assembly members voted yes on that final constitution uh, in early 2014. From far left to the far right, to the center right, center left, everybody was in agreement. And this took two years of negotiations between all the parties to come to this point. And I think this was extremely important in allowing Tunisia to move forward with its democracy during the last 10 years. And the second uh, very important success story in Tunisia is how Islamists and secularists have been able to work together, actually, in several, several governments, uh, in the parliament, of course, but also in, in, in different governments, we have seen Islamists and secularists together in coalitions. It hasn't always worked very well in the sense of delivering results, and I'll come back to that uh, later, but at least it shows that they can overcome their differences, that they can agree on certain points like democracy and human rights and freedom and, and so on. There were also mistakes and shortcomings. I will not say that everything was perfect in Tunisia in the last 10 years. If they were perfect, we wouldn't be here. You know, we wouldn't be in, in the mess we are in today. So, for example, a big mistake, I think, in Tunisia was the electoral law itself that was passed in 2011 for the Constituent Assembly, which um, actually encouraged uh, independent candidates and small parties at the expense of large parties and big parties. Uh, and the idea was that it wa we wanted everybody to be included in this uh, uh, constitution writing process. So we didn't want to you know, give too much power to the big parties. We wanted everybody to be including, including independents. But that law worked well for the Constituent Assembly. It didn't work well afterwards for, for the parliament. The parliament became too fragmented uh, too divided uh, and, and sometimes unable to really uh, quickly uh, find solutions or resolve differences. Same thing, the law on political parties, I think, was designed to weaken political parties because I think after 50 years of dictatorship, people were afraid of political parties and said, no, we don't, you know, we had only one political party under Ben Ali and one political party under Bourguiba. And so political parties in the minds of Tunisians were synonymous with dictatorship so, and with corruption, of course. So in the last 10 years, Tunisia has failed in building real uh, political parties, political parties that have a vision, political parties that have the ability and the capability to implement that vision and have the training mechanism and the, the expertise. Uh, that did not happen in the last 10 years. So we continued to basically work with uh, smaller parties and independent uh, uh, candidates who are not really able to, to put uh, in place their, their vision. And I think the biggest mistake, the third and biggest mistake, was that, was that uh, we did not pay attention, or especially the politicians did not pay enough attention to the economic situation. They focused mainly on the political reforms, on building the democratic institutions, uh, uh, on the constitution, the elections, the, the uh, you know the uh, all the political institutions, but the economy uh, stagnated for for ten years until, of course, the last two years. Then we had the pandemic, you know, the COVID uh, virus, the coronavirus, 
which made the economy much worse, basically brought the economy to a standstill. People are really were in big, big trouble in the last two years. Uh, as you know, Tunisia has a, is a big uh, tourism uh, country. We have uh, six to eight million tourists who come to Tunisia every year. But that stopped completely uh, in the last two years. And so a lot of people found themselves unable to provide food. So um, the, the fourth factor that really made it very bad is foreign intervention. You know, we had uh, uh, countries in the region that did not want to see Tunisia succeed as a model for democracy in the Arab world. Uh, namely, I'm mentioning here Egypt, uh, United Arab Emirates, and Saudi Arabia, uh, but possibly other countries as well, uh, who felt threatened by democracy in Tunisia. Even though Tunisia is a small country, maybe far away from them, but they felt that if we can show that democracy can succeed in Tunisia, then maybe later on their, their own population will say, hey, why not here? You know, why can't we have the same rights and the same uh, accountability and, and, and good governance uh, here? So they've been plotting uh, for at least three years now to, to, um, to, to stop and destabilize really this, uh, this democratization process. The military, uh, Egyptian military, built very strong relationship with the Tunisian military especially the intelligence, the Egyptian intelligence uh, uh, people with the Tunisian intelligence people. And b basically over three years, they've been training them on how to uh, not only obey the president in whatever he says, you know, forget the constitution, but whatever he tells you to do, you have, you have the responsibility to obey the president, even if he asks you to do something illegal, which of course is, 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 is unconstitutional and is not right. But so really the Egyptian have uh, uh, military, uh, you know, officers, intelligence officers have been running the show for the last year in Tunisia. I don't think it's an exaggeration. I think they've been on the ground. They've been advising Qais Saeed in the palace itself, and and they've been meeting with opposition members on a daily basis. I can't hear you, uh, Mustafa. I'm sorry. So, do you hear me? I want to. Yes, is my sound? Yeah, I want to ask you a question right on that because one of our viewers just asked a few minutes ago, Khalil from VA, Virginia, as I understand, how much support does Saeed, President Saeed, have from the police and military? That's a question coming from Khalil from uh, Virginia, and I think that's important because, like, should we imagine the current presidency and his drive as a kind of a regime allied with the military, as we saw in Egypt? or it's, it, it's not That's that simple. Question. Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. I don't think it's that simple because the military in Tunisia historically has uh, shied away from politics and has not been involved in politics. So what has happened in the last year or possibly two years, uh, even before the coup, is something new to the military uh, in Tunisia that they, I'm sure that the majority of officers and even of soldiers are not happy with, they are not comfortable playing this role of uh, uh, supporting uh, a coup or closing down the parliament. They don't want to be uh, involved in politics. Unlike in Egypt, for example, where the military has been ruling in Egypt since Jamal Abdel Nasser in the 50s, uh, 70 years ago. In Tunisia, it hasn't been the case. In the police also, the police has been reformed and there's, there are many people who uh, are uh, accustomed to, to the new uh, you know, thinking. But of course, Qais Saeed has had a whole year now to replace many leadership uh, in the police, in the Ministry of Interior. He has sacked over 200 people in the top leadership of the Ministry of Interior. Uh, you know, let's say between 150 and 200 uh, to be more accurate because we don't have an exact number. But he has replaced them with his, with his own people and people who support him. So he has more support in the Ministry of Interior and much less support uh, in the military, I think. Mark, a hallmark of authoritarianism is to recreate the bureaucracy in your own yes. image, you know, which happens elsewhere to it. <laughs> okay, very good. We'll come back to you, Radwan, but I want to go to Monica, okay. who is joining us again from Tunisia, uh, who's been watching events on the ground. And Monica, first of all, what do you think about this whole one-year process? And also, I want you to tell us a few things about the constitution that Said Kais, uh helped draft and 
which is going to be voted just next week. Like, what do you expect? What, what kind of a constitution is this? And what do you think the result will be? Yeah. Um, when Caius Syed took all three branches of power into his own hands, um, surprisingly, I think it came to us as a shock to most people on July 25th last year, he was playing on deep currents of desperation in the Tunisian public. A lot of Tunisians felt that they had tried different political parties in, in a variety of permutations, and no matter how they uh, combined the jigsaw puzzle, um, the game never delivered for them. And as Rodwan had alluded to, the economy was getting worse and worse, um, crippled even more by COVID. So, you know, so, so the situation was um, ripe for a reestablishment of Zaimism in Tunisian political culture. This is a deep current in Tunisian political culture. Tunisian history, Tunisia's modern history has um, been a, a, a system of government ruled by one um, dictatorial father figure throughout most of the past hundred years. So it's really the uh, democratic transition, which was an enormous achievement, but an unconsolidated one. Um, things like a constitutional court hadn't been created, etc. Um, that was the, really the exception to the rule. And Syed was playing on that. Um, a lot of Tunisians who, are, who have become critical of Syed in the years since will remark that he was lucky in a lot of ways. Um, the situation was, was ripe for what he did. Um, some people last year around this time, on July 25th, predicted that Caius Syed would be true to his word. The, the clean-handed constitutional law professor who eschewed political parties and simply wanted to, um, to make government deliver more effectively for people, or so he alleged, would be true to his word. And if he stayed um, past the state of exception that he had initially promised, the Tunisian people would be able to rise up and swiftly overthrow him. Um, a lot of people who bought into this point of view inside Tunisia and outside the country had a vision of Tunisian civil society as strong, united, um, flexible, nimble, effective, all of these things. Um, but what happened in, in the past year is that Kaya Syed actually systematically marched towards consolidating his dictatorship one step at a time. And the steps he took were quite rapid. And unfortunately, Tunisia's political opposition in both political parties and civil society across the ideological spectrum has been, broadly speaking, ineffective at stopping him. They've been unable to stop him so far, although a number of, of valiant efforts have been mounted, he has marched onward. Um, you know, we could go down the whole laundry list, the litany of things that Syed has done um, to instantiate authoritarian rule in Tunisia, but I'll just name a few, which will be familiar to many viewers. Um, he took over the High Judicial Council, which was the closest thing to a body safeguarding judicial independence that Tunisia had established. He took over the Elections Council and he placed his own people inside it. So he has a habit of gutting, eviscerating institutions and putting his own yes people inside them. He's been using military courts to prosecute his political opponents, um, arresting people and even imprisoning them for weeks or months at a time for uh, having criticized his July 25th power grab as a coup um, and more. Um, he has made Mansef Marzouki, Tunisia's first democratically appointed president after the revolution, a longtime human rights fighter, the most um, prominent poster boy for Tunisia's dictatorial consolidation. Mar Marzouki um, has been sentenced to years of prison in absentia. Caius has called him evil uh, and a traitor, and he's currently in exile in France. This is Tunisia's first democratically appointed president. Regardless of his flaws, he has not received due process. These claims um, are unsubstantiated. And most recently, of course, we've seen Kaya Syed apparently single-handedly authoring this constitution that's going to be put to vote here in just a few days. Um, Kaya Syed promised um, to create a consultative committee of hand-picked experts, yes people from the legal field, and even the recommendations of those hand-picked yes people were, um, were, were unacceptable to him. He wrote off those recommendations, summarily dismissed them, said, no, I don't like your draft constitution. I'm just going to present to the country for vote a constitution that I basically wrote myself. Um, so 
those uh, committee members of Kaya Syed's consultative committee came out actually denouncing him, which would have been um, tragic comedic and Venezuelan soap operatic if it weren't happening in such a serious and sad context of um, Kaya Syed hammering nails into the coffin of Tunisia's democracy. These people came out and said, we have nothing to do with this. They were posting on their Facebook pages saying, this is a bastard child. It's, it's not our son this constitution. That's coming from his biggest yes people. Um, after that, Caius uh, Syed unexpectedly edited his constitution in a bunch of different places. He corrected a lot of grammatical mistakes. It was very, very sloppy and careless the way he released this constitution into the public sphere. Um, he, without asking permission from anyone, of course, uh, edited the constitution without providing more time for people to consider it before they vote. So we're seeing, of course, characteristics of sultanistic rule, a style of dictatorship that is heavily contingent on the whims and specific personal ideology of someone who's in power. Um, Syed, Syed supporters claim that he does not have an ideology. Um, I think he's closest to Gaddafi, Gaddafi in the 1970s and 80s combining um, promises that he is going to deliver Tunisians the best thing for democracy since, since ancient Athens and sliced bread and empowering all these local committees and taking out the middlemen, taking out the civil society organizations, the media outlets, the political parties, um, just obliterating the middlemen and liberating the, the Tunisian personality at the lowest level to have its own democratic voice. That's the bill of goods that he sells, much like Gaddafi did in Libya, in the, the Libyan Jamaharia or Gaddafi state back in the 70s and 80s. But similar to Gaddafi, what he's actually doing in terms of policy, if we look more at this constitution, is reestablishing a highly, highly centralized system that actually has much more in common with Bourguiba's 1959 authoritarian constitution than Caius and his supporters would like to admit. So we've seen a lot of infractions and violations in the process. Um, the process itself, of course, has been totally unconstitutional, built on an illegitimate and un unconstitutional presidential coup that happened on July 25th. But there's a level of desperation and exhaustion in, in Tunisian society that have prevented, I think, either side, the pro kaya side or the anti Kaya side from mobilizing a lot. And that's one of many things that I've been seeing as I've been traveling around Tunisia South and, and central cities and towns in the past few days that I'm happy to discuss more. Wonderful, wonderful. And I mean, all this sounds to me a milder version of what has been happening in Turkey in the past 10 years. But even a milder version of that populist authoritarianism is quite concerning. And and it happened in one year. So, I mean, these things get worse and worse, I mean, from my own experience and observation. So, like, packing bureaucracy with your own people, changing them all the time, calling your enemies traitors or enemy, enemy of the people traitors. And that sort of, these are all the uh, worrying signs of your, uh, of authoritarianism. And, and, and we see this all across the board, I mean. So let's go to Doug. Uh, Doug, uh, I should say that I'm amazed by your energy to fly to four corners of the world from North Korea to Middle East uh, almost every week to, you know, really observe things on the ground. So you were in Tunisia uh, recently and you've writ written a very important article on that. So can you also uh, share some of your thoughts and also what you think about the points that uh, Radwan and Monica made? Oh, we don't hear you. Yeah, Radwan and uh, Monica have uh, really covered the issue very well, I think, in terms of the issues that are out there. We are facing a very serious problem, and I should say the Tunisians are, because obviously, ultimately, this is an issue for the Tunisian people, that uh, their government is what they will be living under, you know, they will be suffering under, so that this future matters uh, very much to them. It's a good time to be talking about this. You think about uh, President Biden making his pilgrimage uh, to, uh, you know, <laughs> Mohammed bin Salman over the weekend, uh, you know, kind of begging for oil. That really encapsulated the American government's, the problem, the tension between principle and interest, which the U.S. government very often finds itself. So the question of how the Biden administration is going to be viewing, you know, what's going on in Tunisia and how it's going to respond to this ref ref referendum really is up in the air. And I think it's going to be a very important test for how serious they are 
about democracy. No one particularly believes Saudi Arabia is anywhere close, but to lose Tunisia, which had been such a model and had been so promising, I think would be a very major blow to the aspirations that uh, President Biden has expressed. I mean, as discussed, I mean, one of the, the one of those great moments of human freedom was back in January 2011 when Ben Ali was forced to flee. I mean, all of this came out of a street vendor who'd been brutalized and mistreated by police, set himself on fire. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, it shows the, the horror that he was feeling. It uh, launched the demonstrations that brought down a long running dictatorship. And uh, you know, as, as Radwan mentioned, that I thought one of the important aspects of this revolution was bringing together religious and secular people to work together and create a moderate government and to try to, to meet everyone's needs. This, this demonstrated how in the Middle East one could move beyond the kind of uh, stereotype of uh, you know, whether you're an Islamist or you're a secularist, you can't work with the other, it has to be dictatorship. Tunisians were coming together and it wasn't a perfect uh, you know, experiment as was mentioned. I mean, the problems of economic, COVID was a massive hit, both in terms of health, also tourism. It clearly placed a lot of pressure on a new government that was getting its uh, feet, and it didn't uh, respond to these problems terribly well. Nevertheless, look around the world and ask, where have these problems been solved? Uh, I mean, look uh, in the Middle East, look at Europe, look at the U.S., look at China. And even the most seasoned uh, and long-term governments face these kinds of problems as well with often great difficulty. And I think Tunisia matters an awful lot to democratic countries, certainly to the United States, to Europe and to others. So <clears throat> because what you see, I think, is, is something that, again, is a model and something that can be held up in areas that don't have freedom, areas that don't have democracy and demonstrating how people can overthrow a government and create a liberal society. They can come together. So enter this equation, you know, Kai Saeed, who you know, won election without a lot of people knowing exactly what he stood for. I mean, he, you know, he had to, took the right stance in the sense that he criticized an establishment that wasn't working. He criticized corruption. He criticized the sorts of things that everyone, for the most part, uh, disliked. <laughs> and no one quite imagined what they were going to get. And uh, I think the interesting question is, did he have this all planned or did he see an opportunity? You know, who knows? But uh, what is extraordinary is how he's managed to without constitutional authority, dismantle every democratic institution within the society. And that, I think, is the frightening thing. And that's where, you know, whether the, uh, you know, the military and police, where they stand, you know, the fact that you know, even if standing off and allowing him to do this and to ultimately the police arresting people he directs, et cetera, has allowed him to act unconstitutionally against opponents, critics, opposition parties, et cetera. So, that really has been a step-by-step -step dismantlement of democracy. I mean, it, you could, it's hard to imagine a better instruction manual in terms of how to do it, where you, you, you simply take one institution after another, and the very critical ones, judiciary and election commission. I mean, when you control those, of course, you control what the votes are going to say when they're cast, and you control any sort of a, uh, an attempt to overthrow uh, you know, outrageous uh, you know, actions you know, with the courts. And, uh, you know, as uh, Monica mentioned, I mean, looking at the Constitution itself, how it was written, I mean, this is someone who everyone who deals with him, both domestic and foreign, finds him to be very unresponsive, not someone who takes seriously, you know, the opinions of anyone else, not somebody reflective. You know, any politician, you know, can be very difficult to deal with at times, but unless you're willing to actually talk with people, understand the objections and engage, which he does not do. I mean, it really is the sense of he has the answer and he's the only one. The fact that he threw out his handpicked committee's constitution to you know, insert his own, he's created this massive process of consultation and other things, and then none of it mattered in the end. He just did exactly what he wanted to do. And what's frightening about it is it really is an authoritarian constitution. I think that you know, it's one that would fit very well with his dictatorial predecessors. As uh, you know, Monica mentioned, I mean, and others uh, who I met in uh, Tunisia also mentioned that they this is kind of the Qaddafi model. You talk about democracy, he has this kind of inverse pyramid of power moving upward and whatnot, but the system is built to empower one person, him. And it would be interesting to know what kind of a constitution he would recommend if he wasn't the president. 
I mean, almost certainly this is a constitution he created for himself. Now, the, the question ultimately, of course, is once he leaves the scene, however it is, if this is the constitution, what will the next person do with it? I mean, he's not the only one who could use this you know, thing. There's a long term impacts here. We have the referendum upcoming. The question of what's going to happen, you know, the attempt to boycott, uh, the presumption, I think, as Radwan said, is that it'll pass, or at the very least, he will say it passed. And since he controls the election commission, it's hard to hard to contest that. And then <laughs> where do things go? And uh, the assumption, and I think probably a pretty good one, is that he will not deal with all of the problems that caused people initially to accept what he did. That is, he has shown no answers for economic issues no answers for social problems, no ability to bring people together to solve these problems. And that inability is likely to lead to extraordinary frustration of people who are suffering. You know, we have high food prices coming out of the war between Russia and Ukraine, raging inflation internationally, shortages of goods, fertilizer, all of this is happening. My guess is he's going to face unrest because he doesn't have answers for any of this. And then the future is very uncertain. Are these protests that might oust him? Might the military decide to act, even though it, it does not, you know, to its credit, has never wanted to be a politically active military? Uh, you know, where, where does this go? Does he run to the uh, Saudis and the Emiratis? Are they willing to bail him out, the Egyptians? You know, we really don't have a good sense. And it's scary because, of course, all of the last thing one wants to see in a country like Tunisia is violence, disorder, and chaos. And when you destroy the rule of law, you destroy democratic institutions. The danger is he's leaving that as seeming to be the only answer for a frustrated population. And that, I think, in many ways is his greatest crime, that if he leave, creates a situation in which the people he claims to be representing see no option but to try to rise up to him. And that, I think, is very problematic. The question ultimately then uh, for the U.S. is what should it do? I think the First point is the uh, U.S. government has to recognize its limitations. Ultimately, Tunisia's future is up to Tunisians. So it's not for the U.S. to prescribe a future. I think what the U.S. should do is do its best to encourage democracy, encourage the, the freedom of the Tunisian people to set their future. The U.S. should be working with Europe, which, of course, is closer. It has an awful lot at stake, both prior colonial contact at, uh, at stake in terms of trade, refugees going to Europe, all of these things, Europe matters an extraordinary amount. The U.S., uh, to the extent that it can exercise some influence, would be good if it can encourage the uh, Emiratis, Saudis, and Egyptians to stay out. They've caused enough tyranny around the world. They fund each other and other regimes. They should stay out of Tunisia. I think the U.S. has to consider to what extent it wants to cut aid at least to government institutions. Uh, no one wants to hurt the Tunisian people. This is one of the, the problems here of what kind of a, how one moves forward. But certainly the U.S. doesn't want to empower and strengthen institutions that are acting against democracy. And that's uh, it also gives an incentive to say if things turn around, that aid could be restored. But the U.S. doesn't want to empower the wrong forces. Uh, the U.S. should certainly make clear it supports democracy. Um, and we are ideas and other ideas include applying the Magnitsky Act sanctions, that is individual sanctions against Saeed and his strongest supporters. Again, with an idea that if they move back uh, to a democratic course, that could be lifted. You know, these would focus on individuals you know, acting undemocratically as opposed to broad sweeping sanctions that would hurt the Tunisian people, which the U.S. definitely wants to avoid. The, uh, you know, the question of, uh, <laughs> I mean, the, the ultimately... The big problem, I think, in Washington is going to be getting the Biden administration's attention. Uh, so much is going on internationally. It's hard uh, to get them to take a tough stand on any issue, and especially with everything else that's going on. But I think it's important uh, at the end to realize this is an issue that should not be ignored because it is critical for Tunisians, but it also matters well beyond their borders, it matters to uh, you know, northern North Africa, it matters to Europe, it matters to the United States. I think everyone would like to see a democratic Tunisia that can move forward, one in which the Tunisian people have the opportunity to set their own future. So my hope is the U.S. can be helpful in that regard while recognizing it can't make the future. It can't make the choices for the Tunisian people, but uh, they deserve the support, uh, any support possible uh, for themselves to make those choices. And I'll stop there. 
Doug, thank you so much. You covered a lot, including what the U.S. should do, and I agree with you that you know there should be a principled foreign policy regarding Tunisia and 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 the whole region, and you know supporting authoritarian regimes or looking down, you know, looking the other way around when they were doing things has never helped the region itself or even in long-term Western interests. You know, uh, now. I want to, we have actually very interesting questions coming from our audience and I want to leave enough time for them. But before that, I want to ask you uh, a few quick questions. Radwan, everybody who spoke here mentioned that the economy was bad, right? I mean, and so Tunisia was able to keep political liberalization going, but the economy was not good. And, and that ultimately when such things happen, Sometimes a strong man comes and says to the people, support me, you know, give up your freedoms and I'll fix your economy. What ha happens is that economy isn't fixed, but you lose your political freedoms as well, too. I think that's that's what's going to, I'm afraid, happen here. But can you tell something then structural? We spoke about this before even the conversation. So uh, my sense is that Tunisia was great in political liberalization, but not economic liberalization uh, with a very stagnant uh, public sector created under a very socialist past and lots of uh, inefficiencies. Do you agree with that? I mean, if, if there's one way forward, that would be partly liberal economic liberalization. Um, yes, I think we need the we need the free market. I mean, I think I, I believe that uh, uh, the best economy uh, is one that comes from a free market economy. Uh, the state has a role to 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 play in you know, providing minimum protections and guarantees for the poor uh, people, or you know, uh, providing them education, health, and and so on. But what we have in Tunisia right now, and what we've had for fifty or sixty years, is actually a mishmash of uh, capitalism and socialism. And I would argue that we have the worst of both systems. We have the worst of capitalism, which basically is corruption. And, uh, and monopolies, you know, monopolies by certain people and certain groups who monopolize the, the economy. So we have the worst of capitalism and we have the worst of socialism, which is people who are getting salaries and doing no work at all. You know, it's just the government providing all these salaries to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are not producing anything or, uh, or uh, sometimes not even showing up for work. So, yes, I think we need... Uh, free market economy we need serious economic reforms uh, uh as soon as possible uh the imf loan now that uh, there is a discussion between the tunisian government and the imf about what kind of reforms are needed are going to emphasize some of these uh, uh, economic reforms that are needed and have been known for almost 10 years but uh, I don't think any of those are possible without democracy without good governance without accountability I think that if the IMF loan is given to this regime, to ISIS Ayyad, and under this new constitution, there is no transparency at all and there is no accountability at all. There, nobody will know where those $4 billion or $5 billion or more, uh, uh, where they will go. Nobody, will, nobody can, can really supervise uh, or monitor uh, or, or, or decide in, in a democratic way what are the priorities and how should we spend that money? So uh, I think that if we want Tunisia to succeed, uh, we must insist on, uh, on a democratic path, you know. And, and once we have a democratic path, the economic reforms become the next step and the logical step. Unfortunately, in the last 10 years, we haven't had time to, to implement those reforms. And then again, we were hit with the, with the COVID and the, and the pandemic. And now everybody agrees that we need to focus on the economy, but we can't focus on the economy if we have a dictatorship. If we have a dictatorship that is silencing the political parties and silencing the debate and perhaps even cracking down on dissent and cracking down on opposition. Right now, as we speak, Rashid Ghanoushi, the president of the parliament, the speaker of the parliament, and the president of the main largest political party in Tunisia, the Anahda party, is being um, um, interrogated uh, in front of a judge right now at this time, uh, and perhaps might be arrested. We don't know. We, we are still all waiting to see what happens. You know, imagine if that happens. Imagine if Rashid Ghanoushi, the speaker of the parliament, the leader of the main opposition and main political party in Tunisia is arrested, 
there will be so much turmoil in Tunisia that really there is no way that uh, Qais Saeed can implement any economic reforms unless he becomes a very big dictator, a very tyrant, you know, very oppressive regime. Um, and that even then it won't work because the upheavals and the, the demonstrations and the protests uh, mm -hmm. will, uh, will, will grow out of control and the government mm -hmm. will not be able to control it, I think. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, thanks for mentioning uh, Rashid Ganoushi for him, who I, who I have great respect. And I've, he's not just a political leader, of course, in Tunisia, but he's an yes. Islamic thinker yeah. who has worked a lot yeah. you know, theoretically on reconciling yeah. Islam with not just electoral democracy, but civil liberties as well. I mean, in my book, Reopening yeah. Muslim Minds, I have a great quote from him where he says, if there is disrespectful speech coming to Islam, Muslims should respond by better speech in, in, instead of banning it and censorship speech and so on. He, ha he, has, written over, he, yeah. he has written over 20 books uh, on the topic of Islam and democracy exactly. and women yeah. rights and minority yeah. rights in yeah. Islam that have been translated over, yeah. you know, 20 yeah. languages uh, all yeah, over yeah, the world. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. I read him in Turkish in the 90s, so yeah, I know I know this yeah. there. And yeah, it, He's a great, he's a very important thinker. Which brings me to my second question, which I want to actually pose to Monica, which is the question, I mean, whenever in the Arab world these issues are discussed in Egypt, in Tunisia, there is a question of the Islamists, right? I mean, oh, yes, there is electoral democracy, but Islamists will come to power with electoral democracy and they will use democracy ultimately to create a very liberal regime. And there is some truth to that in some cases. I mean, like this has to some extent happened in Turkey. In, in Egypt, maybe Ikhwan had that potential, although we didn't even see what was going to happen. But in Tunisia, the Ennahda party, the so-called Islamist party in Tunisia, was actually the most liberal leaning of all Islamic political movements, right? I mean, in my view. And, and Ganushi worked a lot on that. And actually, they gave up on the whole title of Islamism or political Islam. They said, we're Muslim Democrats. And... For those people who can think this is just a tactic, I mean, when you look carefully, when you look into it, there's a lot of thought behind it. So, there, and I, I sometimes see some people are using this argument, oh, to preempt the Islamists, we need strong men, uh, strong leaders, which is the argument behind, for example, the dictator of Egypt, for example. Is that argument a part of a discussion in uh, Tunisia, Monica? And what do you think about that? And uh, people who care about women's rights and, you know, whether the Islamic political forces will come in destroy these things uh how do you how do you judge that as in general and in the context of tunisia it we have to my main area of expertise is can you hear me yes now we yes. do yes great yeah that's that's right up my alley because my main um area of research focus for the past 11 years in tunisia has been religion state relations islamism secularism and the internal party politics inside the Anatha the movement. Um, so I can say that for scholars of this stuff, for scholars of political Islam and scholars of religion, state relations, the region, for de they, they're very well aware of the fact that for decades, um, authoritarian systems of government in the region played on fear of radical theocracy taking over if any windows of democratization were opened, if any oxygen was let into the political room, so to speak. Um, they would say, they would, in, in essence, the, they would forward the argument, you know, you might not like me, you might think my tactics are heavy handed, but if you, if you push me out, your alternative option is a theocratic system of government like Iran. You know, and that was certainly an argument that Ben Ali um, spent decades making here in Tunisia, and it had a lot of play. Back in the 1990s and 2000s, some listeners will remember that Samuel Huntington's clash of civilizations really shaped the, the framework and, and drew the boundaries of a quite narrow and, and culturally essentialist debate that feared something essential. It often feared some, some essential quality about Islam that was uh, inherently opposed to democracy. And you know, that just wasn't evidence based. And, and the proof, we, we've seen the proof in the transitional pudding in Tunisia. Tunisia has had three free and fair elections um, over the past 11 years. Um, and not the party respected the results of, of each election. Um, and it was even beaten fair and square democratically by an opponent party, 
uh, that identified as a secular modernist anti-Islamist party called Nida Tunis in 2014. So that was a demonstration, that was proof that so-called Islamist or, or political Islam parties can be beaten democratically. So what it takes to beat them isn't a dictatorship because we also have decades of in evidence that indicates Islamists of various stripes, some more violent than others, tend to fester and blossom and multiply under authoritarian regimes. Um, so it's not dictatorships that can defeat Islamist movements for good in, an, in a sustainable way where they actually win the battle of ideas. It's allowing more oxygen in, into the room. It's democracy. It's having stronger political parties, beating them at their own game. Um, for the past decade in Tunisia, we've seen Ennahda consistently lose vote share. From 2011 to 2014 to 2019, it's getting less and less of the vote each time. It's lost a lot of its base, a lot of its base. Um, in part because of frustrations that its leadership was willing to um, pragmatically, but some would argue corruptly or selfishly or self-interestedly, partner with members of the old regime, with incumbent Ben Ali era elites, which you could argue um, was, was necessary, unfortunately, for the survival of the first stage of Tunisia's transition, but was one of those roadblocks that Radwan alluded to that prevented the country's political leadership from undertaking very important reforms, ranging from fighting corruption to um, transitional justice to actually undertaking political and economic reforms that would have um, decreased the amount of Byzantine red tape in Tunisia's economy without cutting the social safety net entirely under people that, that you were referring to, Mustafa. Um, those reforms weren't taken, and Anatha's base got angry at them for making those pra pragma arguably pragmatic partnerships along the way, um, and for not delivering, you know, for the same reasons, too, that a lot of Tunisians are upset, and a lot of Anatha's base left them, too. So they, Anatha, you know, if you're an opponent of Anatha, you could argue that they were doing a very good job um, of, of falling on their own swords <laughs> and that Nida Tunis had actually defeated them. So why can't you build a better party? I think one of the most under-recognized reasons why we're at this tragic um, despotic juncture in Tunisian politics today is the explosion of Nida Tunis, which was the big party that stood up to Anatha and could have actually um, participated in making Tunisia a kind of competitive two-party system. Um, it was a, a crazy quilt coalition built for one purpose, defeating Anatha in the 2014 elections. And the president, Bejikai Sebsi, who was the one ruler, I would argue, in, in post-2011 Tunisian politics, who actually had the political capital to undertake a lot of these really tough reforms, security sector reform, economic reform, corruption, etc. He didn't do any of that. The only piece of legislation that he, for, he put forward in his years of presidency was something called the Economic Reconciliation Act, which essentially amnestied corrupt business people from the former regimes. So you saw, um, you saw a focus on ideological tensions from Tunisians and from a lot of Tunisians and a lot of Western observers in the early stages of the transition when a lot of important reforms could have been made. And this ideological obsession on the old, we would have hoped outdated question and Islamophobic and culturally essentialist question of can Islam and democracy mix? The obsession with that question really sucked up a lot of critical bandwidth. And unfortunately today, 11 years on, after three free and fair elections, after Nida Tunis and Anatha going into coalition together, after Nida Tunis' victory over Anatha, et cetera, et cetera, you still hear a lot of people um, asking those same questions as if the 2000s and the 2010s and this whole democratic experiment in Tunisia never happened, which um, is a very dangerous and, and tragic case, case of amnesia. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, very good points. I think basically the argument of those Arab dictators we're speaking about is like, we have to be authoritarian, otherwise other people will come and they will be authoritarian. And, you know, that, and what, then, you know, you're just perpetuating this tyranny. And, and, and that yeah, probably and if, if I could just add like two sentences. I, I forgot to say this, but there's an Article 5 in Kaya Syed's personally authored draft constitution that goes much farther, ironically, than Anatha ever went in putting political Islam into Tunisia's constitution. It actually says Tunisia is part of the Islamic Ummah, 
which and not the in their wildest dreams didn't even debate uh inserting in the 2014 constitution sometimes sometimes those dictators try to outbid the islamists you know in their uh references to islam as a political force now i want to come back to dog but also i want to leave time for questions is that dog okay i'll come back to you finally on your to take your or you want to add something on these these points before that okay great thanks uh now we have several questions and one is from jim moran who asks are there any up and coming political figures for example alpha hamdi who might have the potential to be a unifier especially on behalf of the young adults who represent the majority of the electorate uh any take on this uh, maybe radvan or monica i'll, I'll jump in um okay i i never I never hear Ulfa Hamdi's name come up in discussions of um, opposition politics or potential uniters. Um, you know, I, I think in some Western circles, her name is a name that's discussed, but actually on the Tunisian street, um, totally immaterial. So as far as I've been able to see. Okay. So, and do you agree, Radwan? Uh, Ulfa Hamdi or others are uh, interested. I mean, politicians but it takes time you know you have to build credibility in the country you can't become you know the, uh, art, it can't be artificially created you know it ha you have to be uh, within within the social network and the political network but i think also we need political parties i mean even if ulfa hamdi has the best of intentions unless she has a strong political party with her to implement that vision you know, this, uh, I think political parties are really crucial for the success of democracy because, you know, uh, individuals cannot implement uh, solutions, cannot even come up with solutions, let alone implement them and, and solve the problems of a whole nation or a whole country. Uh, so what is really essential in Tunisia right now is we need to change the law on el the electoral code and the law on political parties and really facilitate the creation of three or four but real political parties we don't need 200 as we do or now tunisia has over 200 political parties we th i think we need three or four or maybe five but strong political parties with clear programs clear visions and they can compete based on those programs and those visions the people may may, may give them the the choice and may elect them then they have the ability because they have experts in every field they have programs that they have been developing and and studying for years before they come to power that's what political parties are i don't see how democracy can work with ulfa you know replacing qais saied with somebody else or or rashid ghanoushi with somebody else that's not the answer the answer is building real political parties real systems you know the uh, democracy it's not an individual who's going to save the problem. It's it's a political system that mm -hmm. works like a, like a big institution, like a big machine. Thank you, Radwan. And we have a question from Jonathan Allen, uh, who says, "If the Tunisia if Tunisia democratizes again, how can we keep another autocrat like Said from taking power and restarting the cycle?" The million dollar question, but it's a matter of political culture and. The big, the the size of the state too. If you have a, such a size, usable state which employs like a million people, you said, Radwan, out of a population of eleven, yeah. coming yeah. to power yeah. and putting your people yeah. in there will be always an incentive, right? Uh, but also, yeah, of course. Uh, that will be one. Any thoughts on Monica uh, on how for the long term? Like, is it a? It's a new democracy. I mean, Tunisia is discussing these for I'll, ten years, so we I'll, I'll be throw out. I'll throw out one. Um, one factor here, we could talk about this all day, but for the sake of brevity, just one factor. Um, Tunisia could have could have created a constitutional court. And if this ever happens again, again, if this once in multiple generations, perhaps once in more than a century opportunity ever lands, falls in the lap of Tunisians again, creating the essential institutions of democratic checks and balances is critical. Um, Tunisia's elected governments, one after the other, put off create the creation of a constitutional court, which, had it existed, could have potentially been a check on Syed. But because it didn't exist, um, there was no alternative body besides 
besides the widely discredited parliament in, in a lot of people's eyes people a lot of, a lot of people fed up up with it even though it was the legitimate body and and remains the elected parliament of 2019 remains the sole legitimate um governance body in tunisia but it, it could have provided another force of an institutional check and balance. And, you know, here I'm reminded of, of Turkey and Turkey's many challenges with democratization insofar as um, a lot of the same institutional architecture of the Turkish state has been appropriated by different actors, be they Kemalist actors who are closer to, Tun to Turkey's military in past decades or um, actors like Erdogan. Uh, or, or folks who are closer to him, there's a there's a great temptation, as you alluded to, Mustafa, to eat, to devour the same institutional architecture, or just kind of ignore it because changing it is too hard, which is what happened here in Tunisia. But the, the risk is, if you don't, in that small critical window of time you have, somebody else can gobble it right up um, and, and reify the old system, which is what we're seeing here in terms that I think are even starker than the de-democratization we saw happened in Turkey. I think it's, I disagree with you a little bit there, Mustafa. I wouldn't call it milder here. I would call it, um, I would call it more rapid, more ideologically esoteric, um, and in some ways more dangerous, but there are a lot of parallels. Okay, thank you so even much. Even though yes. neither Erdogan nor Kaya Syed would want to admit that. <laughs> they like to see themselves yes. as opposed, but they have a lot more in common than they want to say. Yes, I mean, authoritarian leaders might be on the different parts of the political landscape, but they might be very smart. Actually, one of our viewers, David Simon, asked precisely about that. He says, I know it's a different but related topic, but the group also has considerable knowledge concerning Turkey. Please comment on the state of and the prospects for freedom and democracy in Turkey. And where do you think uh, Turkey is likely heading? Well, just one, a few words for me. I mean, Turkey is probably this most extreme example of a illiberal democracy where elections take place and elections are meaningful. Uh, but the person who wins the elections, who's been willing the elections, President Erdogan in the past 20 years, has been consolidating power over the whole bureaucracy, judiciary, the 90% of the media. Uh, and Turkey is heading to elections in a year. So we will see maybe a magical, miraculous turn can take place because elections still matter. Maybe the opposition can win and there might be really an end to this extremely illiberal populist authoritarian rule. Or maybe it can be four more years of the same thing downhill, which is which is a grim scenario. So we will see. We have to watch Turkey. We can have another conversation on Turkey, but do his thing. So I want to go back to Doug. Doug, also there is a question that maybe you can also say a few things uh, on which you can say a few things. A Tunisian citizen says, anonymous, maybe it's not safe to be fully, you know, uh, non anonymous in Tunisia, as I don't guess, but if he says, he or she says, if KS decides that's the president, decides to reestablish relations with Tel Aviv to get some relief, uh, how the Biden administration will react? Oh, I mean, you can combine this, if you will, like you said. I mean, it was mentioned that President, uh, President uh, Said also tries to have connections, establishment, I mean, help from Saudi or UAE. Like, uh, what are the maneuvers he can uh, do to, you know, look maybe more acceptable in, in Western capitals? And what would be your advice on, on, those, uh, on those policymakers in those capitals? You know, I think that what we're facing shows the importance of, um, of, of the citizens being invested in the system to understand that they have something very much at stake in the democracy. And that shows the importance of political leaders addressing their problems. And I think we certainly see that uh, in Tunisia today, that hopefully that'll be a reminder when democracy is restored. The, you know, the issue of, I mean, Saeed clearly is going to look for aid from outside actors. It's interesting that so far we haven't seen the Saudis and Emiratis doing a lot there. And uh, you know, maybe they've decided it's not worth it. Maybe they've decided other issues are more important. Hopefully the U.S. can help convince them to stay out. You know, the question of whether you know, that, that he could buy support from the United States by another recognition of Israel, I think that's less likely after uh, the president's visit to the Middle East. In a sense, the president played his big card with Saudi Arabia. It didn't happen. But he also made, you know, visited Israel and made kind of the political gestures that are important in the U.S. 
So I don't think the president feels a great need for another initiative at the moment that primarily would rebound to the benefit of the Israeli government as opposed to anyone else. If it was the Trump administration, actually, it wouldn't surprise me at all that you might see that. Biden, I think, might have, you know, he's, I think Biden's commitment to democracy is greater. And because it's greater and he's also already kind of made the play in some of these issues, I don't think he feels quite the same need to jump in here. And I do think he recognizes how democracy was working that this is a significant loss and to be bought off you know, by that kind of a gesture would be a very significant stain, I think, on this administration, which progressives uh, would be particularly critical of. And at the moment, the president really doesn't want to have more problems uh, within his own party. Thank you so much, Doug. And uh, with that, we've come to the end of our time. And apologies to a few other uh, viewers who asked questions, but feel free to reach out uh, our speakers or me after after the event. Thank you so much, uh, Radovan, Monica, uh, Doug. It was a great discussion. Tunisia is important, not just for Tunisians themselves, but for the broader region. So as a friend of Tunisia, I wish for the success of this beautiful country and this beautiful nation. So we'll see what happens next week with the referendum. Maybe we can make a second round on how things are going uh, in the months ahead. But thank you for this wonderful conversation. Thanks for joining us.